On behalf of the Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft, the German Atlantic Association, a very warm welcome half around the globe. Good morning to Washington, good afternoon from Berlin, and good evening in Moscow. Welcome to the New Atlantic Talk. My name is Werner Sonne. I'm a journalist by profession and a board member of the German Atlantic Association, and I will be your moderator today. We certainly live in a restless world. We have a common thread, a tiny little virus that spreads everywhere, and we tend to forget that we all share an even worse danger, the renaissance of nuclear weapons. And the pressing question here is, what is the future of the arms control? It is unfortunately a very timely topic, and we will discuss it with high-ranking experts from Washington, Berlin, and Moscow today. And you're also witnessing a new format, the new Atlantic talk. Klaus Schariot will tell you all about it in a minute. Klaus Schariot is a former top German diplomat. He was the state secretary in the German foreign office and then moved on to become the German ambassador to Washington. And he is also a board member of the German Atlantic Association. Klaus, your, the floor or the screen is yours. Thank you, Werner. Hello and welcome, dear panelists, uh, dear members and friends of the German Atlantic Association. Dear guests, welcome to the first Atlantic Talk webinar of the German Atlantic Association. I'm very pleased that so many of you have joined us, probably from all over the world, and I would like to warmly welcome all of you, quite especially our distinguished panelists. First of all, Ambassador Susanne Baumann, here from Berlin, welcome. Uh, also, John Arath, who joins us from Washington, D.C., and Dimitri Trainas, uh, Trenin, who joins us from Moscow. I'm very glad that all three of you could make it and accepted our invitation. Thank you for that. We would, of course, loved, have loved to do this in person, uh, personally in Berlin, and all of you had already agreed to come to Berlin. Unfortunately, Werner Sonne already referred to that. The current situation does not allow for a direct personal dialogue. At the outset, I would like to introduce the new format which we have created the, under the title uh, Atlantic Talk. And this evening, this afternoon or morning for Washington is now the first in this serious Atlantic talk Berlin. Once we have uh, Corona over, uh, we of course will meet again in person in Berlin. But for the time being, we have to do with this uh, Zoom seminar. Atlantic talk is a follow-up to our previous successful series NATO talk around the Ban Bogotá, which we founded in 2008 in the presence of German Chancellor Angela Merkel and NATO Secretary General Rab de Hoop Schäfer. Now, why did we change the title? NATO, of course, continues to be an essential common undertaking, both by Europe and North America, it's in the strategic interest, both of North America and Europe. But we share more than the alliance. We share common interests, uh, the common interests which go far beyond the realm of security. And we share also common values, the values of the enlightenment, that means democracy, rule of law, freedom of the press, and all of that. We are convinced that the transatlantic dialogue continues to be of the essence. Thus, what we need today, more than ever, is Atlantic talk. And that's why we have this series. Our first, first topic is the future of arms control. Why that? Ever since the Harmel report in 1967, 
and that means for more than 50 years now, arms control and disarmament is, in addition to defense and deterrence, one of the two main pillars of NATO. And until February of last year, we had three major agreements on arms control in place, INF, Open Skies, and New START. But now, I'm afraid we are in dire straits. INF is terminated. Open Skies might come to an end in November. And New START might be expiring in February 2021 if Russia and the United States don't agree on an extension which might be possible of up to five years. Let me just say a few words about each of them. Let me explain why all three of them are so important from our point of view. INF, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, was, in my view, one of the greatest success stories of Soviet-US cooperation on arms control and disarmament. Maybe Ronald Reagan's and Mikhail Gorbachev's finest hour. Why? Because for the first time in 1967, they succeeded in outlawing a whole class of missiles, namely all land-based missiles having a range between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. It eliminated 2,700 missiles. And in addition to that, it provided for verifiable verification. It created a special verification commission, which meets if either party uh, so requests. And it uh, created a nuclear risk, nuclear risk reduction centers, providing continuous communication. It was, in short, an essential, essential example of our rules-based security architecture. It enhanced transparency and it reduced the risk of conflict. So I think it was a huge success for the logic of arms control. I won't go into the history, that's too much. Let me uh, suffice it to say that it was the final outcome of uh, the introduction by the Soviet Union of the SS-20, uh, targeting every part of Europe, but not the US, and thus uh, making a, a decoupling between Europe and the uh, United States possible. NATO reacted with a double-track decision, later with a zero option, then came Reykjavik and the historic success on INF. So everybody thought at the time, huge success. What went wrong? In 2004, 2005, already, Russia proposed that Russia and the United States together jointly withdraw from INF. Why? Because Russia was concerned of proliferation of missiles in China, in North Korea, in India, Pakistan, and Iran. The JCPOA in 2015 solved the Iranian problem, at least for a while being. But in uh, February 2007, at the Munich Security Conference, Putin again criticized INF. And quite unlikely, it was John Bolton, not in a public function then, who in 2011, in the Wall Street Journal, argued also from the US side for leaving it, also because of China. The Obama administration, beginning in the middle uh, of 2014, began to raise the issue with Russia, saying that Russia was in violation. And in December 2018, NATO foreign ministers unanimously demanded that Russia comply with INF. In February last year, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo suspended INF, announced withdrawal in August, and one day later, Putin followed suit. So all constraints on the production and deployment of ground-based missiles are gone. That was central to European security. And we also lost the verification system. My question to all of you, is this wise? Wouldn't it have, wouldn't it have been possible to talk with China and keep INF at the same time? One word on open skies. Open skies is not a bilateral treaty but one between 34 member states. It entered into force in January 2002, was negotiated between 90 and 92, 
because the then members of NATO and the then members of the Warsaw Pact. And it really allowed the entire territory of member states to be open to unarmed observation flights by monitoring aircraft. Each state has an active quota of flights it can demand and a passive quota of flights it has to accept. And the greatest advantage of open skies is that the pictures taken have to be shared with the inspected country and with all signatory states requesting them. That means unlike satellite pictures, it provides for a common basis. It's the best example of a successful confidence building measure because the open skies material can be used to prove a violation which satellite uh, pictures often can't because they're secret. And the flights together with other member states uh, can also be used to signal support, which for instance had been the case in Ukraine. Because you can say, uh, we observe what's happening and we hold you responsible. Now the US has announced to formally withdraw from open skies in November 2020 which would, in my view, be a huge loss, not only for confidence building in Europe, but also for all states not possessing as sophisticated satellites as the US and Russia do. Last point, new start. It's now the last major arms control agreement not yet challenged, signed by Presidents Obama and Medvedev in 2010, entered into force in February 2011, it limits all, it limits the number of deployed nuclear war warheads to 1,550. That is more than 60% less than the original START treaty. And it limits the number of intercontinental ballistic missile launchers and submarine launchers and, and heavy nuclear bombers to 800 and those deployed to 700. And it provides also for inside inspections. Now, the good news is that according to the press, Russia and the United States agreed to talk about New START and about an extension. I think I read uh, it starts in, on June 22nd in Geneva. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. From my point of view, the question is, shouldn't we extend uh, New START for the five years, which is possible, and in the meantime, use the time to also include China? I wish you all a great discussion, and I now uh, give the floor again to Werner Sonn. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this uh, very uh, intense and informative uh, introduction to our topic. And uh, let me just uh, tell our viewers all around the globe that you will later in this program can also ask uh, questions in writing, which would, we will then pass on uh, to our experts. We'll come again to the Atlantic talk with three very distinguished uh, experts. Klaus has already introduced them. And uh, let me go uh, first to Susanne Baumann. She has a long title and I have to read it. She is the Federal Government Commissioner for Disarmament and Arms Control and the Director General for International Order, the United Nations and Arms Control. A warm welcome to you, Frau Baumann. Um, and I have a question to uh, all of you. And uh, uh, Klaus has already raised it in an optimistic tone, but I uh, ask it anyway. Are we still in a downward spiral when it comes to arms control? Or do we really, like Klaus said, see light at the end of the tunnel first? Um, Obama, uh, what's your view on this? Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps let me start uh, by thanking you of inviting me to this first round of the Atlantic talks. I think it's very important to have uh, this kind of discussion with our friends uh, from Washington, especially in times uh, that are, how should I say, a little bit difficult for the transatlantic relationship. Um, when it comes to arms control, to disarmament, especially also to nuclear disarmament, Europe and the US seem to have a different approach. 
And that's not only true for the field of disarmament, but when it comes uh, to, to solving global issues. Whereas uh, the US uh, concentrates more or less on the doctrine America first, for us Europeans, uh, the multilateral appro approach, uh, the support uh, of the multilateralism is important and we see this at the core of, of a problem solving right now. And this different approach, unfortunately, has also direct impact on our security policy and on arms control. In our assessment, parts of uh, the US administration uh, put the question mark uh, be uh, behind the contribution of arms control to security in general. And um, the result of this policy approach is that we do see a withdrawal of the US from a current arms control architecture. Um, the two of you have mentioned already uh, JCPOA, which is put into question by the US, I think, in the proliferation field, that's a really a, a difficult issue and a blow to, to our endeavor to keep Iran away from a nuclear weapon. Uh, the Open Skies uh, Treaty in the field of conventional arms control is another example, and the uncertain future of um, the New Star Treaty is an actual example in the field of nuclear disarmament. Um, but uh, today, in these difficult times, it is exactly now that we have uh, to work uh, together because we have to face the volatile, a volatile security environment and uh, this security environment and the challenges which are coming with it, we can only solve when we really invest in a strong transatlantic link. This is true that we need a joint uh, answer to Russia's violation of the INF Treaty, but not only to the violation of the INF Treaty, but also to the build up of the nuclear capacities of Russia, uh, which are endangering European security. This is also true for a joint answer um, to proliferation challenges, be it North Korea, be it chemical weapons in Syria, or be it uh, Iran. And we also need a joint answer uh, to, to look into the challenges China is posing us, so we see a more assertiveness by China also in the nuclear field. And here I think the transatlantic uh, uh, cooperation um, has also to deal with this problem. The problems are there, uh, but we have to look into the future and uh, prospects perhaps with, uh, the, uh, with uh, the resumption of the strategic security talks between uh, Russia and, and the US are very much welcomed by us. And of course, we stand ready to, to cooperate mm -hmm. in all these fields. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Baumann. And we now move on to Washington, to John Ayres. And um, he also has a long and, and uh, distinguished uh, career in this specific uh, field. He is now a senior advisor at the US uh, State Department and was before that, uh, before recently, he was still at uh, the White House and the National Security uh, Council and he is the expert uh, on uh, and pro proliferation and arms control. Uh, same question uh, to you, uh, John. Uh, do you see still a downward spiral or is there light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to arms control? Uh, thank you very much. I want to begin by saying that it is a real pleasure to be able to do this today. Uh, it's uh, something I've been looking forward to for some time. And uh, I think it is particularly important to keep these lines of communication open uh, throughout the Atlantic uh, community and among allies, because these are the most important issues that we face when we uh, look at international security today and communication is what uh, will make us more effective in addressing them. Uh, I, would, uh, I would use a different uh, geometric metaphor rather than uh, spiral. I would say it's cyclical. Uh, arms control goes through cycles where there is more or less progress depending on a large number of uh, political factors and the, what the international situation is. 
That said, the reasons why arms control is important remain the same that they always have been. Uh, it is something that is essential to international security and to the security of each of our countries and to the, the uh, future of the world. Uh, things are very different now than they have been. And the approach of the US administration is uh, to look at what the actual international situation is and what measures might most effectively address it. Uh, we're not living in the, in the 1980s. When the uh, INF Treaty was negotiated, things were very different. The uh, international order was defined by superpower competition. Today, it's a much more multipolar world. Uh, there is uh, no, uh, it's not a bilateral dynamic. Uh, it's a, a very different situation. One of the primary threats now is not from a US-Russia nuclear exchange. It's from the growing proliferation of weapons of mass destruction around the world. Uh, we look at the situation in North Korea, the uh, uh, continued instability regarding Iran, and uh, we see various other countries occasionally making uh, these, uh, these thoughts that they should pursue nuclear weapons as well. Uh, in short, it's a deterioration of the NPT order that has existed since the late 1960s. Uh, that's not to say that the US-Russia relationship is not important. It is, it's very important. But generally speaking, the deterrence regime that we have works with Russia. Uh, arms control cannot continue to be simply about a, the US-Russia dynamic. Uh, the bilateral approach is not enough. Uh, also, what we see is in the Trump administration, there is no patience to have agreements simply for the sake of having an agreement. Uh, the White House is going to be very interested in steps that will improve US and international security, and they are going to use that as a test. Um, I would say a few words about the uh, INF Treaty. Uh, when I used to do uh, lectures on arms control and its history, I would point out INF as the example of good arms control uh, for the reasons that Ambassador Shariot described. It did a very good job of doing what it was supposed to do for many years. When it became detrimental to the security that it was supposed to protect, it ended. Uh, it got to a situation where it was restricting only the US. Russia was going ahead and building intermediate range weapons uh, without control. And it was very difficult to argue that we should continue in a treaty where only the US was bound by it. This does not uh, do very well with the America first part of the, uh, of the Republican Party and uh, many, many influential people here in Washington. It is also important for the future of arms control that violations of agreements should have consequences. Uh, this is a, um, I was in a discussion at NATO where this was the main theme. And this was, I think, part of where the alliance came out on this. It's also important to note that the US did not make this decision unilaterally. We did it after much consultation with allies uh, in Washington, in Brussels, and in capitals. Uh, there was a pivotal discussion between President Trump and Chancellor Merkel in Buenos Aires that resulted in the decision for <clears throat> just how to do the timeline to uh, get out of the treaty. Uh, I would also say uh, to address the New START Treaty, this is a, uh, obviously it's going to be something very important uh, over the next uh, six months to one year. Uh, there is not a decision in Washington yet about whether or not the treaty should be extended. Uh, it's something that we need to talk to Moscow about and to understand what their vision is for arms control in the future. Uh, the, the key point that I would like to make today is that uh, New START should be extended if it is going to lead to further arms control. If it, if it becomes the end, if it, if it cuts off further discussion on proliferation, on arms control, on bringing China into arms control regimes, then there is not a reason to extend the New START Treaty. I hope that Russia will see things the way that, that we do and will agree that this should be a, a door that we open to a new era of arms control and not the end of the road. Uh, one thing I have heard from the, uh, the uh, 
very important people in this administration many, many times is uh, that the president feels strongly that it is better to have no deal than a bad one. Uh, so we're going to be looking for something that is a good deal that is going to advance the uh, security of the world and lead us to a situation where there will be fewer nuclear weapons. If that is not happening, then it is be the case to extend New START becomes very difficult. So uh, I think I'm going to stop there and uh, leave the uh, remainder of the issues for questions later. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, Moscow to Dmitry Trenin. Uh, good evening, Mr. Trenin. Uh, you also have a long career in this uh, field. You even uh, served as a colonel in the Red Army in East Germany a long time ago. And now uh, you are the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Welcome to our talk. And now, uh, what is the Russian view on all of this? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Werner. It's a pleasure to be on this illustrious panel. It's a great honor for me. Thank you very much for this opportunity for this invitation. Uh, I must say that I do not speak uh, for Russia. Uh, I'm just one of uh, so many millions of voices in Russia. And uh, I can give uh, very much an inside, outside view of, uh, of uh, where Russia is coming from and where Russia is headed uh, on that issue. And just one thing, when I was serving in Germany, of course, I was a young lieutenant, a lieutenant to, colonel, to, to captain, uh, not, not, not a colonel in those days. Uh, those were very, very nice and important years for me. Um, let me say that uh, basically uh, Russia is uh, even more interested in, uh, in arms control than the Soviet Union ever was. For a very good reason, Russia is so much weaker than the Soviet Union. A uh, corollary reason is that uh, the Russian leadership uh, realizes how arms race in uh, the, the 70s and the 80s helped uh, drive the Soviet Union into the ground. So there's every reason, non-idealistic, for Russia to pursue arms control. On the other hand, I think that the analysis in Russia, uh, in the leading circles of Russia, is that uh, um, arms control is uh, gradually giving in as an instrument to manage uh, uh, Russian-American relations, let's say US-Russian relations. Basically, their view is that uh, um, since uh, the United States has no reason to look at Russia as a superpower. It has no reason to actually be tied by the uh, agreements that were signed in the years that, uh, um, that saw Russia in those days, the Soviet Union, as the other superpower. But I would say that uh, the problems of arms control have only um, something to do with the uh, position that the Trump administration has taken on international treaties and uh, uh, international and national security. There are momentous geopolitical changes in the world. And uh, the US-Russia axis is no longer, it's 30 years since it ceased to be the central axis of global politics. Uh, there's another central axis, uh, not exactly uh, an analog of the US Soviet one, but increasingly important, the one between China and the United States and arms control in that relationship is not present uh, because of the decisions taken in China. Uh, with the uh, continued rise of China, uh, it is that relationship that is uh, that is becoming more important. And the confrontation that one now sees developing between China and the United States is going to shape our lives. Uh, I wouldn't say almost in the same way as the US Soviet did, but it, it will have a lasting, very important impact. Another challenge is nuclear proliferation. There are so many countries around the world that are not and will not be tied by uh, arms control treaties and arrangements. And I agree with John, it's, uh, 
the, the, if, if there's a threat of a nuclear war in this world, it is uh, less likely to be a, a, a war consciously being prepared in Washington and Moscow against each other. There are other hotbeds, potential hotbeds of tension that could lead to nuclear, um, uh, a nuclear collision, a nuclear exchange, if you like. Then there are technological changes. You're talking nuclear, but uh, in today's world, uh, there's a whole array, as we all know, of non-nuclear strategic weaponry that is uh, as effective as any nuclear weapons were in the days of the Cold War. There's cyber. There's that, that's a totally different uh, entrant uh, onto the stage of, uh, of global security. There are doctrinal changes uh, with, uh, with regard to how the various nuclear powers see their, uh, their nuclear policies and how they develop their nuclear forces. So basically, uh, it all comes to, to this. Uh, responding to the question uh, that uh, was raised a few minutes ago uh, by Werner, is, is there uh, a light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, I think there's a flicker of hope that uh, this treaty that is, uh, that is due to expire on February 5, 2021, might yet be saved by the, uh, the current administration in Washington, because I think that the Russian position is clear on, on this. They, uh, they are in favor of extending the treaty as, uh, as a simple extension. No, uh, no, uh, no new negotiations about the nature of the treaty, simply extending it as the treaty provides for, for another five years. Um, and I think that there's also an interest in, um, uh, and a serious interest for the reasons I have enumerated, Russia's uh, uh, relative weakness. There's an interest in continuing uh, I'm talking economic weakness, not, not nuclear weakness, not strategic weakness, but, but more, more economic weakness. Uh, continuing um, uh, uh, arms control with the United States. But uh, there is a less and less um, uh, hope in the Russian leadership that um, uh, this will be the future. So basically, and let me just wrap it up by saying, that as I read uh, the, uh, the statements of the Russian government uh, and the sense of Russia's security policy, I think that they are uh, hoping for an, the, an extension of arms control for another few years, but they are at the same time preparing for a world without arms control, a world in which uh, security will rest on, uh, squarely rest on deterrence. Deterrence is even now the mainstay of, uh, of, um, of security of nuclear powers. So deterrence, communication that would give you reliability, deconfliction that would prevent incidents or prevent incidents from escalating, uh, a measure of dialogue, preventing strategic misunderstanding, transparency, to prevent uh, tactical operational misunderstanding, unilateral restraint or mutual restraint and unilateral steps and many other things. Whether China can be persuaded to uh, join in, uh, in this new um, set of uh, communications and arrangements, uh, my, my guess is not now and not uh, in the foreseeable future, but with the US-China relationship uh, very much on a collision course, the Chinese leadership, as, as the U.S. leadership also, uh, will be thinking about ways to shore up their national security outside of deterrence. So let me stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, there is a key word that uh, comes up uh, all the time, and that is China. So, uh, John, you made it very clear that uh, the Trump administration does not want a, a, a new START agreement without China, basically. So what, what does that tell us about the, the future of us? I don't think it's as simple as saying there should be no agreement without China. Uh, it's the, the feeling in the Trump administration is very much more that as we think about uh, what is the future of arms control, China should be part of that. 
uh, obviously China cannot join the New START treaty. It's a bilateral treaty and uh, there's just not the possibility to renegotiate it as a trilateral treaty. Uh, but it, we want everyone to acknowledge that as part of the process going forward, uh, China and its capabilities should be in some way included. But how? That's the question. How? Uh, that is a very good question, and I wish I had a very good answer for that. Uh, it's something that we do need to talk to the Chinese about. It's something that we have talked to China about. Uh, it's, it's new ground for Beijing. They are uh, trying to address what is going to be their role as a uh, major global power. And um, they have, I, I believe, and I'm not a China expert, but I believe that there is some interest in arms control, uh, but they want to avoid a situation where they are uh, treated as an inferior. Uh, so one of the keys is going to be to address them as, a, uh, as an equal partner and work on uh, perhaps uh, building transparency and dialogue first, and then bring them into more formal arms control agreements later on. Yeah, if you but want that, to, that is my view. That's something that's that's for the future. Yeah, if you want to believe what they say uh, openly in public, uh, they always say no when it comes to being included in arms control. And Frau uh, Baumann, what is uh, if there is any a German role here? Is Germany only sitting on the sidelines and watching all this as an uh, observer, or do we have uh, any role there? Yeah. Um, thank you for this question. Of course, we do not have uh, nuclear weapons, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we uh, have a role to play because arms control disarmament has direct consequences on our security here in Germany and in Europe. Uh, that's why we firmly believe that Europe, that Germany uh, um, has a role to play. Um, when it comes to China, of course, we see uh, that China over the last years is, um, gro uh, has growing military capabilities. It's the only P5 state right now which is uh, continuously, continuously building up its nuclear arsenal. On the other hand, we have to say that the nuclear arsenal of China is much smaller than the Russian and the US uh, uh, capabilities. Um, and we should not limit our view to China uh, uh, to the nuclear question. What is of huge concern to us here is uh, that China is also heavy investing in new technologies and dom domains. Uh, China is investing in cyber capabilities, in artificial intelligence, um, they are investing in uh, um, hypersonics and uh, when it comes to domains uh, in the domain of outer space. So that's something which is at least uh, of equal concern uh, to us than the build up uh, uh, of the nuclear arsenal. And we are convinced uh, that China being more and more important on, on, as a global power has also to live up uh, to, to uh, this global responsibility, including a responsibility to come closer to arms control. What we have seen over the years is uh, that uh, China is playing a role in the P5 talks. Uh, John, of course, you are much closer to this and perhaps you can elaborate on this. Um, but what we uh, do also see that in the context of the INF discussion and also now new start invitation to the security talks on the 26th, this path uh, um, China very clearly rejects. But because it is important to introduce uh, China, we have to find another avenue and uh, we have introduced uh, this uh, international dialogue on um, uh, new technologies, in especially on uh, the uh, development in the field of missiles. And here we see that China has shown interest. They do participate in this missile dialogue initiative. And I think the challenge right now is, is to find, and way, find ways and means uh, to, uh, to, to identify areas of interest to the, to the Chinese to bring them closer to the ongoing discussions of arms control, 
but um, very frankly, I do doubt uh, that uh, the negotiations on the extension of the New START treaty is the right way to do so. Because New START will run out uh, in the next couple of months and to introduce China more closely, we will need much more time uh, than uh, the remaining couple of months. So uh, um, let me ask you here: What is what? What is it that, that Germany really wants? Do, do, are you ad advocating here that uh, the new Star Treaty should uh, just be extended as it is? Or what is it that what Germany wants? So we uh, pay very much attention uh, to the ongoing discussions uh, with regard to the. Uh, extension of the new START treaty because um, this treaty also affects European and our security. Um, we would not like to see uh, that the new START treaty comes to an end because then there will be no limitations in the field of strategic nuclear weapons. So we try to encourage uh, Washington and Moscow to come to the table and to negotiate uh, the extension of the new START treaty. But it is, is very clear to us that uh, the new weapon systems uh, which Russia has developed, and we all uh, remember President Putin's Poslani speech, where he has uh, presented these new weapon systems, at least some of them have to be included in the new START treaty, that's for sure. And in the long run, we also see the necessity to bring China to the table uh, where uh, uh, nuclear negotiations take part. But we can't make this direct link between the extension of the new START treaty and the uh, introduction of China. Okay, um, so let's, uh, you, you, you did mention that already and let's uh, move to a topic that is uh, much closer to home, so to speak, and that is uh, the follow-up on, on the INF treaty. Um, of course, uh, the uh, Trump ad administration left the INF uh, Treaty, but we should not forget why they did it. They did it because Russia uh, developed a, a new nuclear-tipped uh, missile, the S uh, SSC-8. And my question to Dmitry Trenin uh, is, is there any way that Russia would be ready to give up this uh, new missile? Well, uh Frankly, my view is that uh, the United States uh, felt it needed uh, freedom to develop, uh, produce, and potentially deploy these systems, not so much with regard to Europe and Russia. I'm talking about Europe as a deployment area and Russia as the target, clearly, but uh, primarily with a view to China. Uh, the pre prevalent Russian view is that uh, the U.S. complaint about uh, Russian violations of the INF Treaty uh, were a pretext for uh, the withdrawal from the treaty that uh, uh, the U.S. administration, the Trump administration, was going to do, uh, to do anyway. And this uh, is part of a pattern that started with the U.S. withdrawal from the ABM Treaty in 2002, that, as Putin said, uh, uh, triggered the Russian reaction that uh, produced this array of new weaponry that he put on richly on display in uh, 2018, to which Ambassador Bauman uh, referred just a few minutes ago. So basically, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the were, uh, uh, and John Arath was uh, absolutely right when he said that there were very, very many consultations between the United States and its allies on the, uh, on the withdrawal from the ABM Treaty, but there was never a serious negotiation between Russia and the United States on that treaty. Uh, Russia had its own complaints about, but that's, that's, that's diplomatic. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's more of a, you know, uh, a diplomatic games that uh, both sides were playing publicly. Uh, the, in reality, and I, I, I think that uh, this is important to note, uh, there were also strong opponents uh, within Russia of, um, of adhering to the INF Treaty, but essentially the, the move was made by, by the U.S. As I said, mostly with an eye to, 
to the east uh, with an eye to Asia, with an eye primarily to China. So that would be, and let me just add one, one other thing. Uh, withdrawal from the treaty is one thing. Uh, as such, it does not impact on uh, the security picture, uh, security landscape around the world. What would be uh, uh, truly uh, immensely dangerous is the uh, deployment of INF systems, um, US INF systems in Europe, whether nuclear or non-nuclear. Uh, that uh, would uh, probably lead to Russia uh, revising its uh, nuclear posture uh, with uh, pretty dire consequences for, um, for potential, uh, for strategic stability, let's put it that way. So that I think would be a very, very um, dangerous move if, if anyone is contemplating that. Uh, that's, uh, that's a view widely shared in the Russian strategic community. I'm not uh, quite sure, uh, Dimitri, um, whether you did answer my question. My question, let me repeat it, was, is there any chance that Russia will, uh, will cancel its uh, missile program uh, or destroy uh, these uh, missiles? Uh, I think the answer is very clear. I think it was given by the Russians. Basically, they said, uh, we, will, we will not simply uh, uh, bow to American demands because we have a number of complaints of our own and they're talking about launchers in Romania. And I, sh I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go into all those details. The the or, I, I call that uh, diplomatic games because that's, that's essentially what it was. Uh, the, the sad fact is that uh, the two nuclear superpowers, when they had an issue, and I, I, I accept, I admit, uh, there was an issue, uh, they did, rather than having a negotiation, uh, they chose, and I think that, uh, that the crucial position was that of the United States. Russia chose not to give in. The United States chose uh, to withdraw. That was the uh, and no one uh, and and, and uh, no negotiate no serious negotiations were held by the by the two sides on the INF treaty. The INF uh, again from the again yeah, maybe from a very parochial uh, Moscow viewpoint, uh, people see the U.S. Uh, administration being um, uncomfortable with having to adhere to the treaties that were concluded with another country, i.e., the Soviet Union in another era, i.e. at the end of the Cold War, when those two powers were, in military political terms, co-equals. Now the United States wouldn't want to be, uh, to have its, uh, its hands tied by that old treaty. So that's, that's the view, maybe it's wrong, maybe not, but that's, that's the view very widely held. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I don't want to put uh, words into your mouth, of course, but what I just gathered is that, that Russia is not uh, ready in any way to destroy uh, these new missiles. And uh, John Eros and, and uh, Ambassador Bauman, what will be the consequences? There will be a NATO ministerial tomorrow and the day after tomorrow where this topic will come up, the answer of uh, to, to the um, perceived uh, threat of uh, Russian nuclear missiles. Uh, John Eros, what will be the answer? I think this is a subject that uh, NATO will be discussing, not only at this ministerial, but uh, for several years to come. Uh, there is, uh, uh, as uh, Mr. Trenin mentioned, the uh, development of US missiles that would have been restricted by the INF Treaty if it were still in force. Uh, there, the the uh, possible deployment of such missiles is years away. And it would make sense at some point to have a discussion within NATO as to whether such a deployment would uh, enhance the security of the alliance. But that's going to happen years from now and uh, probably when I'm retired and living on a beach somewhere. Uh, I just want to make very clear that uh, if Russia had continued to comply with the INF Treaty, it would still be in force today. The, the precipitating event in the decision to withdraw from the treaty uh, was the uh, inability after about eight years of attempted negotiations uh, to uh, get Russia back into compliance. Uh, 
That said, I don't think we are going to be seeing a revival of the IN Treaty uh, as it looked in the past. Uh, it is uh, certainly possible that uh, as we open new doors in arms control, uh, we could look at some uh, regime for the control of intermediate range weapons. Uh, I don't know what that would look like. I know it would have to be something bigger than a US-Russia agreement since the great majority of intermediate range ballistic missiles now uh, are not uh, owned by the US or Russia. Uh, it would have to look at the global problem and look for a global solution. Okay, and then Ambassador Baumann, uh, this is a very important uh, question, especially for Germany. Uh, again, there will be this uh, NATO ministerial uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow on, uh, with the defense ministers. And uh, uh, on the agenda is indeed the, the, the response to the uh, Russian nuclear uh, missiles. Um, and uh, what we just heard is that, uh, that the US is planning uh, indeed to develop uh, new uh, medium range non-nuclear uh, missiles. Would Germany be ready to accept these missiles on, on German soil? Um, as John has said, we are far away from the question of deployment. But let me look back and uh, let me state or assess what uh, the deployment of the Russian uh, missile really means. This is a, a mobile uh, system, highly mobile system, which is hard to detect and to defend. It reaches European uh, territory and uh, adds to the ongoing modernization of uh, Russian nuclear capabilities. And therefore, of course, it has a significant impact on uh, European security, militarily as well as politically. Um, I do not want uh, to, to go too much into detail what defense ministers will do during the next two days, but let us look back what NATO de defense ministers agreed already um, in June 2019. They agreed on a well-balanced and appropriate package of response measures which follows the dual track approach. Uh, NATO uh, uh, applies since many, many years of maintaining credible deterrence and defense, and at the same time, uh, underlines NATO's commitment uh, to disarmament and arms control. And I think uh, NATO Secretary General was very clear on many occasions, and uh, I can cite him, we will not mirror what Russia does. We do not want new arm, an, a new arms race, and we have no intention to deploy new land-based nuclear missiles in Europe. And that is where the discussion stands right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, now um, I have to look at my watch and it is uh, 24 minutes past five o'clock in Berlin. And we have invited uh, the viewers around the globe to send us uh, some questions. And I have a few of them here in uh, front of me. And uh, let me go through them. Uh, and um, uh, let me go to this one here. Um, how does the widespread range of hypersonic weapons influence core parameters of any post-INF and or new START treaty? Uh, I think the question is hopefully clear. Uh, it's referring to the new generation of hypersonic weapons which are basically developed in Russia. Maybe John Eras, do you have an opinion on this? Uh, it's going to have to be a subject for discussion as we talk about uh, what the next generation of arms control is going to look like. Uh, it's not just Russia. The U.S. is also looking into hypersonics uh, and uh, where the weapons being developed are captured by the existing parameters of New START. They should be counted under New START rules. If there is a follow-on agreement, it should address these things because they uh, will be important factors in stability in the future. Okay. Another question concerning uh, the nuclear deal with Iran. And uh, the question basically is that it points out to uh, breaches of uh, this deal. 
and it is claiming that um, Iran is uh, is not in agreement with this uh, deal. And what is the, what is the current uh, point of view? And what do you think about that? Uh, uh, I think the basis uh, uh, here, the basic question here is where are we in the Iran deal? Uh, is uh, Iran still adhering uh, to this deal for Bauman? Yeah, thank you very much for this very important question. And right now, the Board of Governors in Vienna is ongoing after uh, uh, Rafael Grossi, the Director General of the IAEA, has presented its, his quarterly report on uh, Iran nuclear capabilities just a couple of days ago. And uh, this uh, quarterly report very closely shows that Iran, unfortunately, is um, not complying with the JCPOA. That's why we, as uh, Germany, plus as France and uh, Britain, plus Russia and China, um, are dealing with these uh, questions, how to bring uh, back Iran into the full compliance of the JCPOA. So, Yes, there are problems. Iran is not in full compliance, is uh, uh, over the ceilings which were stipulated in the JCPOA. However, uh, we are convinced uh, that with the strictest verification and transparency regime we have ever seen, the JCPOA gives us some insight in the development of the Iranian nuclear capabilities. And that's why we continue to work on bringing Iran back and on keeping the JCPOA. Let me bring in uh, at this point uh, Ambassador Klaus Schariot, who in his time was certainly part of the process in the uh, long, long, long negotiations, which led in 2015 to, uh, a, 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 to a deal. Um, when you hear all, all this, what do you think is the future uh, of the uh, nuclear deal with Iran? Is it still, is it, was the Trump administration right in the end to leave uh, this deal? I personally don't think so. I believe that uh, you see we have a clause in there in the treaty at very much at the end of the JCPOA, which uh, would uh, set into motion a process to investigate possible non-compliance. That was not invoked, much to my surprise. I think that is, in my view, a mistake. Uh, we negotiated this uh, process, this complicated process of uh, raising questions. And uh, I don't understand why this was not used. I think just withdrawing from it is a mistake because there are people in Iran who are less interested than the government to comply. And they, of course, get, get the upper hand. I personally believe that the JCPOA was a huge step forward in arms control, a huge step forward. That's why it take, took 12 years uh, to negotiate. And I don't really think it would be in our interest to leave it. And therefore, I'm very much concerned. I believe there is a chance, I think, uh, now uh, Germany, together with other countries, has invoked this process and to find out what the reasons are and to look into compliance. But I think, I very much hope, that maybe uh, next year also the United States might reconsider rejoining it. I think it's a huge and a good example of successful arms control. Well, let me go to Washington and to Moscow on this uh, with brief answers, please. Is there still hope that the nuclear deal will survive? Uh, John Eris. Uh, in uh, Washington, the JCPOA is regarded as being something of a failure. Uh, the goal of the agreement was to improve Iranian international behavior. And uh, actually, the opposite happened. Uh, while we regretted that the uh, agreement fell apart and that Iran did not comply with it, uh, it was uh, probably worth doing to see just as a test if Iran would be willing to act responsibly. Uh, the view in the White House is that uh, Iran has not, 
if Iranian behavior is uh, would uh, change, then I think there would be some willingness to uh, look at what a follow-on might be and what arrangements might be possible. Dimitri mm -hmm. Trenin, the view from Moscow on this. Well, the view from Moscow is that the withdrawal from the JCPOA was a mistake. Uh, it did nothing to ameliorate the uh, situation around Iran or uh, with Iran and with its uh, nuclear program. But uh, people are looking at Washington. The uh, key to the future of JCPOA, if it has a future, lies in Washington. And I think that uh, most people believe that whatever the difference is between the present administration and its opponents, uh, some of the key issues in foreign policy will not be fundamentally changed, and that includes uh, uh, relations with Iran, and that includes the attitude toward the GCPOA. This is, uh, it's, it's considered to be a, a essentially a walking dead as far as the United States is concerned. But this does not mean that, uh, uh, that uh, the JCPOA has uh, outlived all its usefulness. There is still something that can be done by the Europeans, the Chinese, and the Russians. Okay, uh, I now have a question here that kind of widens uh, our topic, uh, but I will um, ask it anyway from a participant who sent it in. Should there be a global agreement concerning cyber weapons? Maybe we, should, we start in Washington. With this. That's a, a very good question. I'm not sure what, uh, what such an agreement would look like. I'm not an expert in cyber issues myself. Uh, but it certainly could be an area for further discussion uh, where we could get some people who are experts together and uh, have them sketch out uh, what, uh, what the parameters of an agreement would look like. To my mind, uh, from experience with arms control, the big question would be uh, how to verify uh, such an agreement because attribution in the cyber world is always one of the key questions. Well, Bowman. Yeah. Um, very difficult question. What we do see is uh, that cyber plays an increasing role uh, when it comes to military conflicts or even below the level of, of military conflicts. So very clearly the need of uh, regulation is there. Um, but as John has said, um, I doubt very much uh, that uh, with the existing um, instruments of arms control, we can deal with the cyber question. Um, with these new technologies, including uh, cyber, uh, make it necessary to develop uh, new approaches in the field of arms control. Uh, we have to address uh, the very difficult question of verification. You can't count uh, 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 cyber activities like you count uh, small arms or like you count tanks. So you need new mechanisms uh, for verification. And as John has already said, you need a new approach uh, to, to attribution. So yes, there is a need for regulations and um, uh, work has already started many years ago in the UN where we try to develop uh, confidence building measures. Work has uh, started in the OSCE also a couple of years back, also with CSPM's transparency measures and I think that the way we have uh, to, to work uh, forward and what is very important, and uh, this has to be underlined uh, time and again, is uh, that international law is uh, the basis for all uh, these regulations which are um, on the way to be developed. Just a turn in the view, again, the view from Moscow on cyber. Well, the view on cyber is that uh, it's, uh, it's a very important issue needs to be discussed. We're still very far from anything like an arrangement, an agreement, but uh, discussions should be started. In fact, Russia supported these discussions uh, several years ago, but the issue ran into the accusations of Russia of having meddled in U.S. Uh, politics, and that's where we are today. Mm -hmm. Then I have a question here that is dealing basically with collective deterrence. It's, um, the question is, NATO seems to have very different views how to approach disarmament and arms control. The common 
ground seems to be collective deterrence. Is deterrence offering sufficient cohesion for NATO, NATO member, uh, for NATO member countries in the long run? So yeah, that's the, 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 the basic question. Is deterrence basically enough uh, for NATO uh, joint errors? Uh, this is a, a very good question. One of the great strengths of the Atlantic Alliance has always been its diversity. Uh, it's an opportunity to uh, hear different points of view, different approaches, and to work collectively to come up with what is the best approach for the group. Uh, sometimes, as uh, all of us who have worked at NATO know, it is a very time-consuming, very difficult process, but the results, I think, speak for themselves, and it generally works out very well. Uh, there's certainly still a role for deterrence. Uh, as the nature of threats moves to more global rather than uh, bilateral, uh, we uh, naturally should rethink exactly how we do deterrence to make sure that it is appropriate to change international circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure uh, you have uh, heard about the intense discussion going on in Germany about a, a, the question of nuclear deterrence and whether Germany should uh, stay inside uh, with an active participation providing uh, air, new aircraft. Uh, to stay within uh, uh, its active role in uh, in uh, nuclear deterrence, and uh, and there is, as I said, uh, an intense uh, debate uh, going on uh, inside uh, the government uh, coalition, especially inside the Social Democratic Party. What do you have to say on that? Uh, I think it would be a very bad idea for me to get involved in a German political question. Then, of course, I have to move uh, this question on to a German participant, Frau Baumann. I think um, it is very clear and there have been some very clear statements on the continuation of nuclear sharing arrangements. Um, it's in the coalition agreement uh, where there is a very clear commitment of the government uh, to uphold uh, nuclear sharing agreements. When it comes to the question of, of deterrence, I think NATO has done very well uh, in pursuing the, its dual track approach on the one hand side uh, to, to um, uphold uh, deterrence and defense capabilities, but on the other hand also uh, to invest in the field of uh, arms control and disarmament. And I think this dual track approach, which uh, NATO pursues uh, since the Hamel report in the 1960s, has contributed uh, to the cohesion of the alliance and will continue to do so. So Germany stands for this dual track approach and we also stand for dialogue uh, with uh, Russia, with a difficult partner um, in the NATO-Russia Council. And uh, we are convinced uh, that these two pillars on, on which NATO stands is contributing to cohesion and in the end to our security. Uh, Mr. Trenin, uh, President Putin has just uh, signed a new nuclear uh, doctrine. Uh, so obviously uh, Russia is uh, very keen to keep its nuclear deterrence. Is that so? Well, Russia regards nuclear deterrence as the bedrock of its uh, security to deter. Uh, and I think that the relationship frankly, between Russia and the United States is based on mutual deterrence. And the only real item on the U.S.-Russian agenda now and for the foreseeable future is to prevent the two countries from uh, an inadvertent military collision. That's where we are. That's as low as the relationship has gone, but that will remain for the foreseeable future. A very, um, I think it must be the last question. Basically, it has been addressed uh, also, but I will uh, uh, transmit it anyway. What is the likelihood of the US and Russia uh, jointly trying to persuade uh, China to join potential future arms control treaties? Uh, basically, we have, have, we have addressed this already, but uh, the, the, the question just came in. Is there any chance that uh, Moscow and Washington will cooperate uh, to integrate uh, China into this uh, important uh, process. John Harris. I, I think I've spoken on this already. Uh, it's uh, certainly there is great openness in Washington uh, to working with Russia uh, to include uh, China in 
uh, future discussions. As Ambassador Bauman said earlier, China is the only nuclear weapons state that is currently expanding its nuclear arsenal. Uh, it is, it is a, certainly at a much smaller number than what the US and Russia currently have, but it is the, the, the part of the, the global uh, stockpile of nuclear weapons that is growing. Uh, and so if uh, we are interested in limiting and ultimately reducing the number of nuclear weapons that are out there, uh, and in Washington, we are very interested in that, uh, this area of growth is going to have to be addressed. And we would certainly be very interested in working with Russia cooperatively on how to do this. And uh, Russia obviously is trying to have better relations with China, playing the China card, uh, so to speak. Uh, Mr. Trenin, uh, is Russia uh, ready to influence China to cooperate here? Well, China is too big a card for Russia to play with it. So it's essentially China's decision right now. And I think that the reasons uh, are quite clear. China is not interested in uh, joining any uh, uh, arms control talks with the United States. Uh, but uh, the way that the relationship uh, between the United States and China is going, uh, there may be a moment. Uh, I don't want to call it a Cuban Missile Crisis moment, but a moment when the Chinese uh, decide that, it's to, that it would further their national interest to have some kind of a dialogue of, on these issues, maybe not on, on arms control negotiations, but some other agreements between the two countries that would reduce the risk of an inadvertent war or, or premeditated uh, but misguided uh, 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 collision, military collision between the United States and China. But Russia will not, as a, as a Russian, as the Russian foreign, deputy foreign minister uh, responsible for arms control said recently, Russia will not just uh, fetch chestnuts out of fire for, for the United States on that issue. So it's up to China, really. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, let me go back to Klaus Schariot, uh, who has introduced us to this important uh, topic, the future of arms control. Now, Klaus, now that you have listened uh, to this uh, conversation with our three distinguished experts, uh, what do you say? Is the glass half full or is it half empty when it comes to the future of arms control? I think, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all three panelists and, of course, also you, Werner, for what I consider a very good start for the Atlantic Talk series. What, I, what makes me hopeful is, uh, and I think John said that at the very beginning, the important thing is to keep the lines of communication open. And I find it important and very good that people from the United States, from Russia, from Germany, uh, discuss these very, very important questions. And I very much agree with what uh, Zulana Baumann just said. We believe very much in this dual track approach that security policy is more than just defense and deterrence. It is also arms control and it is disarmament. And uh, from my point of view, the glass is half full. It will, of course, uh, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so I wish all success to the negotiators on the Russian and the US side in Geneva starting on June 22nd. Uh, and I also hope that uh, you, we all come uh, to a solution to the Chinese problem. This is not as urgent now as extending new start, but I very much believe we have to begin talking with China. And I think there is also a chance because China, in my view, would see this as yeah, the beginning of great power status. And that's not unimportant to China. Thank you all. And thank you all to all the guests who listened to us. I, uh, as I said, I think this was a good first uh, part of our new series, Atlantic Talk. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Yes, thank you very much uh, from me. Also, thank you for giving me the chance to be your moderator today.
Thank you to Washington, Moscow, and to our neighbor here in Berlin for participating in uh, this first edition of the Atlantic Talk. And it would be wonderful if we could continue with you uh, in the future uh, on uh, this new platform. Thank you also to the participants around the globe for your questions and uh, see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye.